Hello, uh, and welcome to the second edition of Lightning Talks here at GopherCon 2020. Uh, it's great to have so many of you joining us today. Uh, we had a great uh, number of people trying to watch us on Wednesday, which is awesome. And we got uh, five talks through. Uh, but thankfully today we have a much longer time. We've got about an hour and 10 minutes. So we're going to try and get through, hopefully, uh, quite a bit more um, lightning talks today, which is, which is really great. Um, so before we start bringing up speakers, I just want to, you know, once again, kind of reiterate why um, I love lightning talks. And, and of course, I'm going to start first with a little preamble about, you know, I, I really miss being able to do this in person. And I think, you know, we all kind of understand that this year. Um, but it doesn't make it any less uh, sad that we can't all be together. And and this is uh, one of my favorite events at GopherCon, the Lightning Talks, where I get to stand up on stage and, and bring up 36, usually, but three dozen people uh, in one day. Um, and I get to meet 36 gophers. Um, and I get to hear from 36 new voices in the community. Um, and hearing from new voices in the community is exactly what the Lightning Talks are all about. Uh, and I've seen so many Lightning Talks start, uh, people start at Lightning Talks and then end up keynoting uh, the main stage. And it's so wonderful to get to hear from all of those new voices because new voices, new opinions, and new ideas are what make uh, the world go around. Um, and so we really need to listen to to these ideas, whether we always agree with them or not. It doesn't matter, um, but we should take the time to listen. And so today we've got about an hour and 10 minutes where we get to listen to some gophers um, talk about their passions. And that's another thing I love about these lightning talks. These people are all very passionate uh, about what they're talking about. And sometimes it's not even code, and that's just wonderful. Um, I love to hear from, like I said, these new voices um, and, and all the passion. So I'm going to ask of you those watching um, to spend the next hour and 10 minutes uh, and give uh, the, these speakers your full attention. Um, and some of these people you may have heard from in the past, um, but I guarantee you that a lot of them you have never heard from before. Um, and so, you know, like I said, please just put down everything else, spend the next hour or so with us uh, and listen to these voices and hear what they have to say. You never know, you might pick up something really, really fun, a new package, a new idea, just a general way of thinking that might improve um, how you go about your life. Um, so let's uh, let's get into that now. So here's what we're going to do. Um, like we usually do in uh, real life when we can, and hopefully we'll get to do that soon, um, you know, fingers crossed for next year. Uh, we're going to have each speaker come up and they're going to have seven minutes uh, to talk about what they want to talk about. Some, some hopefully very passionate project of theirs or some idea or something fun that they've done during uh, this quarantine. Um, over the last, you know, six or seven months, right? So it's gonna be a lot here. They get seven minutes. Um, after at one minute out before uh, they run out of time, they're gonna get this. There we go. So now they know uh, that there's one minute left. And then finally, at about ten seconds out, the curtains are gonna close in around them. There we go. Um, and uh, that's it. So, uh, Jose, are we good on the audio? Just real quick, just want to make sure. Uh, apparently there was a small issue there with our audio, but I think we should be good now. Um, so let's bring up our very first speaker then, shall we? Uh, let's bring up Andy Walker. Andy, are you there? Oh, hello, Marcus. I didn't see you come in. <laughs> you see, I was just in my study with my fluffy cat and a snifter of brandy reading something smart. How are you? Of course. Good. And yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I'm quarantined like everybody else. It's great. Yeah, uh, it's the it's the reading something smart uh, thing that I don't necessarily believe. I, I believe the brandy 100%. Uh, I do not believe that the, you're reading something smart book. And the fluffy cat. I oh, get the fluffy cat, though. The cat is cute. So, Andy, where are you calling us from today, then? Uh, beautiful, sunny Columbia, Maryland. Oh, very nice, very nice. And what are you? What are we talking about here today? Uh, I'm talking about uh, how I developed a uh, search language in Go, uh, but you know, the the so the presentation is somewhat incomplete, but so is the project. So you know, let's do it, Fa right? Fantastic. Well, take it away, Andy. I want to hear from. 
All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, my presentation is called It is Difficult to Make Funny Puns About Parsing Expression Grammar, so I didn't. Building a search language in Go. Uh, about me, I'm a longtime Go user since probably around R60. Uh, I'm a Go GDE, so, and I work in security research and support. I used to work at a company called Sourcefire, which then got bought by Cisco. We made Snort. If you're in you know, InfoSec, you care about that. If not, you don't. I work for a company called CrowdStrike, who's one of our sponsors. Uh, I'm a huge nerd. I have way too many hobbies. Uh, so here's the deal. I want to search things, streaming things, uh, JSON specifically. And I am want to be able to support uh, searching things for my research team. Um, and it's going to be JSON. And a lot of the time, I don't know the structure or I just don't want to care about it. So, you know, how do you deal with that? So let's define my goals, right? I want to do it in Go because I do everything in Go. Um, and that's just that. Uh, I want it to be easy to write and understand, the search language that is. Uh, I would like it to have uh, kind of useful selection operators. The idea is to provide a, a language that you can uh, query uh, these unstructured documents with. Uh, I would like it to be easily, easily extensible, uh, relatively expressive, uh, and you know, performant. Well, maybe not performant. <laughs> I mean, maybe eventually, great, right? but let's not get too crazy here. So my options, it's good to start lazy. The, any good programmer should be lazy. Uh, the virtue of a good programmer is laziness. This is Larry Wall. Uh, you know, uh, so what, what can we do? Well, there's, um, there's JQ and there is a Go implementation of that, but it's not exactly easy to write and understand. I mean, for engineers, maybe, right? But like, I, I don't think that most people who are even, even semi-technical people would be able to look at like, JQ and be like, oh yeah, that's intuitive. That makes sense. Um, it is. It has useful selection operators, sort of, kind of, mostly for transforming. Um, it's not easily extensible from my experience. It's certainly relatively expressive and depending on the implementation, absolutely performant. Uh, let's see, uh, JMS, JMS path, uh, it is it is in Go. It is easy to write and understand, not too bad. Not too bad, looking good. Um, you know, selection operators, it's better. There's no like in, right? Like I can't, you know, say uh, I want I want to look for something where this field has values that are in this list. So it's it's still kind of basic. Um, it's not extensible, right? Uh, there's an issue for this. Uh, it's not extensible, but I get it. I do, right? Like the idea is to be a spec, and if your spec is extensible, is it like really a spec? Um, and it is expressive, but still mostly for transforming, not matching, which is what I'm interested in. Um, and of course the rest is JSLT, JSONIQ, YAQL, then they're not in Go, so I guess, you know, that's that. Um, Go JSONQ is something I found fairly recently, it's worth investigating. Uh, I don't know too much about it yet, uh, but it, it's, it looks, you know, it looks, it looks interesting. So it's, it's, I think it might be worth pursuing. So the solution, I'll just I'll just make my own. Why not, right? Let's get let's let's get parsing. Uh, so talk about a parser. I would like to have a way to break down a query into like these individually testable clauses, uh, kind of Boolean style short circuits. So you know if an earlier clause doesn't pass, um, then you know the whole thing will fail. Um, you know make some operations, hook them in, get traversing. Like how hard could that? Yeah, how could how hard could that be? Uh, so, you know, here's our tree, right? You got your root node. In this case, that starts out, that itself represents um, a Boolean uh, binary kind of thing. So it's it points down into the deeper nodes of the tree, and then you have your terminal nodes where your actual kind of comparisons against your document are going to have them. So I considered Antler, which is pretty cool, does a lot of stuff. Terrence is wicked smart. Terrence is like really awesome. He's been working on, you know, he and his team have been working on Antler for many years. Uh, it's a bit much though. It's pretty heavy. It's got a lot. It does a lot. And like, really, I'm not, I'm not doing anything crazy here. Um, uh, the all-star uh, runtime, which he has created, it, it requires some uh, warming up. And at the time I kind of initially looked at it, the Go version of the runtime had some, some issues. Uh, so I moved on. I also considered Roggle, right? Which is like, Roggle, right? I think it's like so cool, you know, state machines. It definitely made me feel cool, uh, but it's got a bit of a steep kind of learning curve. There's a lot of work, 
Um, but man, like it's fast. It can be super duper fast. So like if I if I was really going to obsess over this, uh, then maybe you know I could take that up later. Uh, so I went with a, a parsing expression grammar, which is like a context free grammar, but it's unambiguous. Uh, it also, but it because uh, so its selection operator basically is in order. The first uh, option is tried, and then so on and so forth. We'll see if we get that. We will. Um, but it requires care and ordering because of that priority. So uh, I went with the pigeon, which is like a Go library, and it's super cool. And it is a parsing expression uh, grammar parser generator in Go. Um, it's a bit like Roggle. And actually, a lot of these projects are like this. There's the Go code that is interspersed with the parser code. Um, and this particular was inspired by uh, peg.js. Um, what's it look like? Okay, well, here is actually, I may as well fit it on the slide. This is the whole definition of my query language as it is right now. Um, oh, I mean, what it, it actually looks like this. <laughs> Got a minute left. Okay, so it actually looks like this. It's very complicated. All right, so language. I wrote a little, uh, I wanted it to be easy, kind of like Lucene or a little visualizer. You can see it right here. Uh, like I wanted custom operations and they have to be delimited a certain way. So I did that. Uh, quotes, uh, blah, blah, blah. This is all, I did RFC 3339, who cares? I mean, it was not a big deal. I mean, whatever. Uh, yeah, but anyway, uh, github.com, flowchartman, AQL. Don't use it yet, but you know, you can see it as kind of a beginning of what to do. Uh, has terrible documentation to do so far. It's very new. Thanks. Wow, I love the speed through ending there, Andy. Well, I got the dig. <laughs> I'm, not, you know, I'm, I'm learning from my prior mistakes. <laughs> one of my favorite parts about doing this virtually, I have to say, is I don't keep running up and down the stage whenever a speaker goes, and I'm done before I realize they are. <laughs> uh, that was great. I've used pegs, uh, peg uh, and pigeon in particular. It's awesome. It's amazing what you can do so quickly with it. Yeah, the, the one thing I didn't get to get to really was that, like, there's more, like, that once you get into like error handling, it becomes a little more tricky. Uh, because a little bit of a nightmare like, and, and holding on to state is, there is a problem too. But yeah, uh, yeah. thank you very much, Andy. We appreciate that. We'll see you next time. Uh, okay, let's bring up our next speaker here. Uh, I believe it is Sohil, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Hey, welcome, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good, uh, where are you calling us from or in the world today? Uh, the cold Los Angeles. Los Angeles, fantastic. So we've had Maryland and now we have Los Angeles. So we're going coast to coast here. Uh, fantastic. Love it. Uh, and you're going to be talking to us today about uh, writing libraries to uh, do Kinesis uh, enhanced fan out. Is that correct? Yes. Fantastic. Well, take it away. I want to hear all about it. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sohil Gogri. I'm a data and infrastructure engineer at GoGuardian. And today I'm going to be talking about how we created a Golang library to uh, use the Kinesis 2.0 library and the multi-lang daemon. Uh, so here at GoGuardian, we have a lot of data related use cases and one of them is using Kinesis for uh, streaming. And we have a whole bunch of Scala as well as Golang stream readers. Uh, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about why to use KCL 2.0. So Amazon released uh, the new version of KCL back in 2018. And it has uh, two main advantages. It uh, has enhanced fan out, which means um, every consumer for that Kinesis stream gets his own dedicated bandwidth as compared to the shared bandwidth before that. And also it uses the HTTP2 API, which is way faster for data retrieval. It's at about 70 milliseconds as compared to the original 200 milliseconds. So those were the reasons we uh, felt like we should be using the KCL 2.0. Uh, the problems we faced were that there were existing unofficial Golang KCL libraries. So AWS has not published a Golang library for uh, KCL yet. So uh, we have been using the unofficial one from VMware, but the issues with that are it doesn't implement uh, the KCL 2.0 using enhanced fanout. Uh, we also found other um, iterations of uh, Kinesis client libraries, but they were either incomplete or it didn't have all the implementations we needed, which is why we had to sort of write one ourselves. Um, as every software engineer or almost all software engineers do, 
copy pasting code from different places and making it work. Uh, that's kind of what we did. Uh, so I've listed down the inspirations or the sources where we sort of reference the code from. Uh, the first one is the incomplete case here that I talked about. And it does a lot of uh, what it should be doing, but it has not been maintained for the past two years. Uh, we also looked at the multi-lang daemon documentation published by uh, AWS and uh, how to use the multi-lang daemon. We also looked at the Kinesis client library implementation in Python. So the way AWS uh, has been writing the libraries is in every language, they have just written uh, the code to communicate with the multi-lang daemon rather than implementing the API from scratch. And that is why we felt like in Golang as well, we should be communicating with the multi-lang daemon rather than uh, coming up with something of ourselves. And obviously, Stack Overflow. Who doesn't use Stack Overflow? Um, so next, I'm going to be sharing a few snippets of code uh, from the multi-lang daemon as well as the consumer that we wrote. Uh, so just to give you a basic background, uh, the way the multi-lang daemon would work is that uh, you would have to run a daemon in your main process as your code. And that daemon would be uh, spinning up are running in the parent thread and it would be spinning up child threads for each shard of kinesis that it is assigned and that child thread is responsible for consuming the data for that particular shard and the way the communication happened between the parent thread running the daemon and the child thread running the consumer is via standard in standard out so talk a little bit about uh, the multi-lang daemon uh, to run the multi-lang daemon, you need to basically get the jar files that are required to run the daemon. Uh, apart from the jar files, we need to provide a properties file uh, to the daemon, which specifies uh, what Kinesis stream to read from, what to name the application for uh, checkpointing and um, all of that. And once you pass all these arguments, you can basically run the multi-lang daemon in the parent thread. And the daemon is responsible for spinning up child threads for each consumer. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about the consumers. So for the consumer, we basically wrote an infinite event loop that would first read messages from standard in, and then depending on uh, what the message is for, processes accordingly. So if it's process records, we are getting a bunch of records. We need to process them, checkpoint it, and return back. If it is something else, do that accordingly. And once it's done consuming the message, processing the message, we need to write it back to standard out that we're done reading this message, and we need to move forward with the next one. So that was the basic implementation. Uh, open sourcing this library. So given that there isn't a valid implementation for the KCL 2.0 and the multi-lang daemon, we want to do something to give back to the open source community by open sourcing it. Uh, some issues that we're facing are we've used some internal libraries for logging and metrics and all of that. So once you ironed out the kinks of uh, using uh, standards for those particular things, we will be open sourcing the library. So be on the lookout for uh, the open source version of KCL 2.0 at, at our GitHub page, which is github.com forward slash Uh That's been my time. Uh, thank you so much. Fantastic. When do you think uh, that's going to be out there? Hopefully in the next month or so. Oh, so by the end of the year, hopefully. Hopefully. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to, to getting to use it. Thanks for all your hard work on that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So that was fantastic. Okay. So we've got another great talk here. Let's bring up our next speaker. Uh, Nishith, is that correct? Yep. That is correct. Hey, how you doing? Well, doing good. A bit late here, <laughs> but hanging great. And so as I've been asking everybody, where in the world are you calling in from? Well, tuning in from Germany. <laughs> From Germany, fantastic. Okay, so our first non-US one today. Uh, hey, you know, you'd be surprised. We got them all. We get them from all over the world, um, which is which is awesome. So, uh, welcome, and you're going to be talking about functional uh, options, right? Yeah, that's uh, entirely correct. 
I mean, Fantastic. my first uh, well, go for con at it. So, well, congratulations, welcome. Uh, let's go, go ahead. Let's let's hear from you. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, basically, the talk would be really quick on functional options, and uh, been hearing a lot about functional options, the, the new fad. But so far, so far, most people are just hell bent on just using them in the constructor arguments. And I'm basically sharing a use case where it actually made sense to use in our APIs. So. Uh, how does a function option look like? It's basically a function that takes a variable number of arguments that can be optional. In our use case, it was uh, actually when we started using metrics. And like every new team out there, we didn't plan it through. We just found this wonderful Prometheus API. And I'm like, yeah, let's start using it. Why not? And which basically boils down to how this code was looking like when you see it. So here's this, just a sample metrics object, which is just a name and a bunch of labels. At least that's how Prometheus handles it. And we had a function to just count a metric. And in the beginning, yeah, we had our things in the context. So we didn't really need to do anything. We said, hey, let's just pass the context in. Everything is happy. We needed a category to observe. It's there. We use it. Everything happy. And then the uneventful thing happened, our code evolved. Just These are just examples, by the way. So uh, we like, OK, now we need to have a latency label on it as well. And like, ah, we don't really want to have it in the context again. That's just yet another code smell. You know what? Throw in another parameter. What, what could go wrong? So let's just assume we were just recording, uh, by the way, don't recommend recording arbitrary numbers as labels. So just for the sake of the argument, let's say we are counting whether it's in the tens of milliseconds, hundreds, or a second. So we just threw another parameter, like everyone put. And then we wanted even more. Read of humankind. So what did we do? Yet another parameter. And now the problem was, because most of our code base was, let's say, not really prepared for the metrics, and hey, we were just filling them in. So sometimes we had missing entries, or for some certain kind of situations, like let's say the latency didn't apply, or like, we don't need the tags here. And then, yeah, zero values, the bane of existence. And what did we do then? Was well, basically turn to functional options. So how did we go from there, actually? Let me just. So this, this, this is basically like what we had before. We had a bunch of calls here, to-dos, and this is basically what this was outputting. You know, so we don't like zero values here. So what we did was, OK, you know what? Let's start using a functional argument. And this is basically how we did it. We said, OK, we have, a let's say, an option func. And that would take in a metric object. And that's fine. Nothing bad there. And then we started implementing one for, let's say, category. Pick in a metric object and return us this option parameter. Now it's pretty easy to like implement them. And there are pretty articles that I would link uh, later. But the implementation was just so simple. It was so well encapsulated that, uh, sorry about this. Let's say we had a category value. We just like put it right there. And then a bit of copy pasta. We did the same for latency, which was an int. Not much there as well. Let me just take the boring stuff out of the way. And same thing. And then we basically had to change our signature. Oh, uh, just a sec, yeah. We did basically one same for off, uh, for the context itself, which actually helped, helped uh, clean a lot of things. We had a context, and I would not write that thing now, but we just extracted them out, which was actually, yeah, basically like something like this. So this code here. And the next thing came where we actually finally adapted call itself and removed all of these shenanigans from here. And the best thing about functional options is they like uh, 
make the API just so clean. The only caveat is we just have to implement an option function. So we have a bunch of options. We get a bunch of options. We just pass the metric object directly, and it was automatically setting the labels for us. And one on the chain was basically here. So basically, these were zero entries before. And now suddenly, we could say, hey, we have a category here and a metric here. Nothing else. We don't need it. And here it was just smaller. So this basically achieved like two main features, which was our zero values that we had to just provide everywhere. We didn't need to do that anymore. And our API was just all the more clean. So in the end, it was pretty much, let's say, we didn't just need them in constructors, but we applied them. And it basically was uh, such an overwhelming experience that we adopted it even further to a bunch of other things uh, where like a certain pattern emerged where we had a high cardinality of optional function parameters. And that being said, that, yeah, I basically created everything in VS Code because I'm a primarily backend engineer. So that's the end of the talk. Wow, thanks a lot, man. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, it, it, it was like, I, you know, I, I always enjoy uh, stuff like that. Uh, functional stuff too really kind of throws me a bit. So it was, it was, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yo, you're welcome. Great. Okay, let's bring up our next speaker, uh, Jordan, I believe. Yes, that's me. Hello. Fantastic. Nice to see you. Hi, hi, Jordan. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I'm pretty excited. This is my first GopherCon and my first Lightning Talk. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Well, welcome. Um, I, I can assure you, GopherCon is awesome if you haven't noticed. It's obviously better in person, but I think they've done a pretty good job this year. Uh, so where are you calling us for in, from in the world here? I am in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. So I'm just uh, a little north of you. I'm up in Boston. Okay, very cool. Well, fantastic. And you're going to be talking about how you cope without Go inline? Yes, that is exactly right. Okay, well, go for it. Let's hear it from you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. So my talk is called How I Cope Without Go Inline. Um, and this is about linting compiler decisions with this program I wrote called GC Assert. Um, and I'm an engineering manager at Cockroach Labs. So I work on CockroachDB, which is a distributed SQL database written in Go. Um, I think that SQL execution engines, which is mostly the part of the code that I've worked on as, a, as an IC engineer so far at my at Cockroach, has been, are they're very, very fascinating. Um, really fun, interesting work on SQL execution engines. They're also very performance sensitive. So I just want to give you a quick example of the performance sensitivity. Um, so I'm going to explain this little code snippet. Um, this, is, this is a tight loop that copies a column of data to another column of data. Um, in Cockroach, we have an execution engine that um, it operates in on sort of column-oriented data. So instead of operating on data that's sort of um, a SQL row by a SQL row, we operate on an entire column um, at a time. So this is this is the code that copies one column to another. Um, you can sort of see uh, that um, we're sort of looping through a, a list called cell, which is a selection vector, which is a, uh, all of the indices inside of a column that are selected by any previous filters in a SQL query. Um, and you can see that you, maybe you have a thousand of these things to go through. Um, and I made a big arrow towards this call to dot get here, which is a function that is going to get the element at a particular index in a data column. Um, and if you're familiar with Go performance, you might know that um, functions, they're not super expensive, but they're expensive. Um, if you're trying to write the most performance sensitive code, you don't want to have too many function calls that aren't inlined. If you look at the definition on the bottom of the screen, um, of this dot get function, you can see it's very simple. And in fact, it will get in line because it isn't doing anything particularly fancy. Um, what I'm concerned with in this talk is how do I make sure that this dot get call is always in line? Um, so how, how can we do that in Go? Is it possible? Um, 
you might know that the Go compiler has a few of these directives, um, like Go generate, you're probably familiar with. Um, and Go no inline is sort of the opposite of what we were just talking about. So uh, Go generate is going to you know, be a way to generate your Go code for you. Um, and Go no inline says, please do not inline this particular function that I'm annotating. If you want to read more about this, you can read Dave Cheney's awesome blog post about Go's hidden pragmas. Um, so right, go, go no inline, it does prevent a function from being inlined, sort of the opposite of what we want. Um, it's kind of funny, I think Dave, Janey, Dave Cheney says, can you use go no inline in your own code? He says, absolutely, although I cannot think of any reason to do so offhand, save silly examples like this article. So that's not really going to help us. Um, can we force, on the other hand, the compiler to inline code with go inline? You might think so. If we have go no inline, do we have go inline? The answer to that question is unfortunately no. Um, and if you go and search on GitHub, uh, you can read a proposal for Go No Inline, which has some pretty funny comments. Josh says, this proposal has basically no chance of being accepted. Go eschews knobs, compiler directives are widely disliked. And Russ Cox says, for the reasons Josh outlined above, we're not going to do this, uh, blah, blah, blah. So unfortunately for us, there is no such thing as Go Inline. So what can we do about it? Um, so we, we can't instruct the compiler to always inline a particular function. That's what we just learned. But can we at least check whether the compiler has inlined a function or not? The answer to this question is yes. Um, if you watched uh, Yana Dogen's talk earlier this week about code generation, really, really cool talk, by the way, um, you'll remember that there's an option that you can pass to the Go compiler called dash M, which is going to output some really useful uh, bits of information about what the Go compiler is doing to a file. So you can see in this example that it, um, I didn't show the, 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 the code that we're running over. I probably should have done that. But in any case, um, it says when it's going to inline a function. It, it outputs some nice lines of text, like inlining call to inlineable function. Um, so given this information, I wrote a tool called GC assert um, that I'm talking about. And it's a program for making assertions about these compiler decisions. Uh, via inline comment directives, kind of like go inline. Um, we're going to be calling them GC assert assertions instead of go uh, directives. It's basically grep on top of compiler debug output. Not particularly complicated. You can see this is a line of code from GC assert itself. And we're just checking a string to see if it has that prefix, inline and call two, that we saw from the console earlier. Right now, GC assert has two things that you can do with it. You can check that a function is always going to be inlined, like we wanted from the earlier part of this talk. Or you can check that a particular slice access was bounds check eliminated. Another interesting talk about bounds check elimination was happened earlier this week. Um, but I'm not going to go into more detail about that. So how do you use GC assert? Um, what you do is there's kind of two steps. The first thing is that you're going to mark up your code. You're going to find a function. So this is the function that I wanted to inline from earlier in the talk this get function, um, I want to make sure that this thing is always going to be inline. So what do I do? I add a GC assert inline directive to the top of the function, like so. And then I run GC assert. Um, so to download it, you can do go get github.com slash Jordan Lewis slash GC assert. And then you can run it against any Go package that you want. And if there are uh, GC assert directives in that package, um, it will find them and assert that they were, in fact, one minute warning. Good thing I'm almost done. Uh, you can also run GC assert from a lint test like this. Uh, the full documentation for this package is on GitHub. Um, I hope that you try it out. We use it in CockroachDB a little bit, but we don't use it that much. I hope you try it out and let me know how it goes. Um, finally, thank you so much for having me uh, as a lightning speaker. Please follow me on Twitter at Jordan A. Lewis. Cockroach Labs is hiring if you want to work on cool performance sensitive problems. Um, as a bonus, I did write GC Assert live on Twitch on my uh, weekly Twitch stream called Large Data Bank. So please stop by and heckle me if you get a chance. I normally stream every Friday, 3 PM, except for today because I'm doing this lightning talk. Check me out, largedatabank.com. Thank you. Wow, that was great, Jordan. I appreciated that. So the idea is once we just discover the, the functions that aren't being inlined, we can then obviously work to get them inlined. Is that correct? Exactly. Fantastic. Okay. Well, I'm definitely going to be trying it out. Thanks, <laughs> thanks so much. So Mark. much. <laughs> I appreciate it. It was a great talk. Thanks for thanks for coming along. Thank you. Bye bye.
Okay, so let's bring up our next speaker, uh, Rama, I believe. Hi, Mark. Yes, that's hey. right. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I can't complain too much. I'm sitting here watching some pretty cool talks. Uh, so where are you calling us from? I'm calling in from uh, Seattle. This is my second uh, GopherCon. Yes. This is, uh, is this your first GopherCon? The second one. Second one. Fantastic. So what was your first one? Was it last year? Uh, it was the year before that. So the last one in Denver. Yes. Oh, fantastic. I love Denver. I miss it. Uh, I, I really enjoyed having the conferences there. It's a really fun town. Well, awesome. And you're going to be talking to us about, uh, what, distributing Beanstalk D, is that correct? Yes. Fantastic. Well, take it away. Thank you. So hi, everybody. So today I'm going to talk about uh, my journey distributing Beanstalk D. So uh, what is Beanstalk D, if anybody would ask us? So Beanstalk D is a fast, feature-rich, priority work queue, which is written in C by this really cool person, uh, amazing coder called Keith Rarick. Uh, it provides primitive operations to work with jobs, which unlike a message queue, it's actually a, a first-class uh, job queue. So if you think about Beanstalk D, it provides a concept of, of a tube, which is basically a work queue. And then you can have a job which can have which has a priority uh, time to run, which is like the time to live for a job uh, execution time. Then uh, the tube the job is associated with a payload and an optional delay. An example job operations that you can perform on Beanstalk D would be like a put where you where a publisher publishes a job into a tube, a reserve where a subscriber essentially uh, can uh, subscribe a job for a given time to run. The subscriber can release the job. If the subscriber wants to bury the job into a dead letter queue, it can do that. Beanstalk D provides first class support for dead letter queues. And it can also touch a job. A subscriber can touch a job uh, which is to which it is assigned so that it can extend the time to run. So it provides all these uh, primitives to work with, uh, with jobs. So, so that's great with Beanstalk. So what's, what are the drawbacks or problems with Beanstalk? So Beanstalk itself runs on a single machine. So there is no replication or high availability in terms of uh, machine failures. There's no native sharding across machines. So clients essentially may have to implement this explicitly if they want to have uh, queues uh, which may not fit into a single machine. And there is no support for encryption or authentication between Beanstalk, the service, and the uh, client. OK, so given all those drawbacks, I decided to write something called as Cool Beans, which is basically my own personal uh, project uh, during COVID, which is a replicated Beanstalk D across multiple machines. Uh, I chose to write it in Go, obviously. Uh, and uh, how does this basically uh, Cool Beans work? So in essence, uh, what Cool Beans basically does, it, it allows the work queue uh, or the tube to be replicated across machines. And uh, it uh, uses the raft consensus algorithm to consistently replicate the job state transitions across multiple uh, machines. OK, so, so my talk is more about like how did I go about doing this? So my first step was to basically understand how Beanstalk D actually works. So I looked at the code. It's open source. It's a very well-documented protocol, and it's well-written code. So it is a plus for me, and I could like really easily understand, and I learned a lot about how uh, the queuing or the, or the work service was actually implemented. So I chose. I started off by rewriting Beanstalk D in Go as a standalone uh, service or, a st or as a standalone binary basically replicating the fun function functionality. Beanstalk D is simple, single, and a single threaded implementation. And it basically uses an event library such as uh, uh, KQD or uh, ePoll underneath. And however, I chose to go with a simple uh, one go routine per client approach. And once I had like a basic implementation run running, I chose to benchmark it against uh, Beanstalk D using a public uh, uh, using an open source benchmark uh, uh, um, pointed out here. And this is what I basically found out. I, I just wanted to get a rough estimate. I ran it on my laptop. 
and I ran about a million requests with 50 publishers and 50 subscribers with an in-memory uh, queue. So uh, none of the data is written to uh, to disk. I found that Beanstalk D gave about 12,800 QPS for publish, about 10,500 QPS for uh, uh, for reserves, and it had about a CPU utilization of about 80 percent. I had a quad core Intel uh, uh, laptop. Similarly, when I ran my Go implementation, I got about 13,000 QPS. This is great. Uh, about a reserve QPS of around 8,000. I had to probably improve some part of the code there. But I did realize that my CPU utilization was a lot higher. And you know it's kind of difficult to defeat uh, a C implementation, especially if it is single threaded, even if you use Go routines. In the end of the day, uh, you would have a few threads running through. So I accepted that uh, uh, the benchmark and I moved on to the next step. So uh, I chose to, so how do I go about replicating this job state which I have uh, present? So I use the raft consensus algorithm to replicate this work queue. What does this actually mean? So I have a few replicas. Every replica is initialized with the state machine. Every replica is provided with the same sequence of operations. For example, if uh, so, uh, you start with a put of a job and then someone buries the job. Every replica goes through the exact set of transitions that ends up in the same state. And the consensus algorithm, which is rough, ensures that all these replicas agree on these transitions. And that's how I can get consistent replication. I evaluated two libraries uh, for implementing this. There was one which is uh, HashiCorp's raft library and etcd has its own. Uh... So using this, I basically, uh, um, came up with, uh, I chose a HashiCorp's library, and this is my final slide where I basically talk about how I started with having Beanstalk D uh, with uh, a standalone clone followed by uh, uh, by a setup with uh, making my client as a sidecar and then with this replication, this replicated setup. So uh, please feel free to try it. So uh, it's an alpha state, so you can go and check it out on the on the GitHub page here. And that's it from me. Wow, fantastic. I got to say, I love the name. <laughs> <laughs> How's it, is, it, is it working out well for you? The yeah, I think, uh, it's coming out pretty well, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I'll have to try it out. I've got some clients who are using Beanstalk D, so I might have to, to give it a play. Thank awesome. you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so let's bring up our next speaker, Sam, I believe. Sam, are you there? Hello. Hey, Sam, hey, how you doing? Good, good. How about you? Ah, not too bad. Where are you calling us from? Just south of San Francisco. Just south of California, then. Fair enough. And uh, are you a high school teacher, I take it? No, I'm a high school student. You're a high school student? Wow, fantastic. Yeah, I'm a senior, yep. Nice. Well, congratulations. Uh, good luck this year, I guess. Do you have any plans for college cool, next you. year? I do. Um, I'm currently in the thick of applications, so it's a bit of a whirlwind, but I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to speak. Fantastic. Well, let's. Uh, you're going to talk about uh, you calculating high school grades and go, correct? <laughs> yep. I hope you're not hacking into the principal's like database or anything. No, I think we're good on that front. Fantastic. Well, take it away, Sam. Cool, thank you. So um, this talk isn't gonna be terribly technical, but uh, really excited to talk about this. This is a project I've been working on for the past year-ish. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. So um, I'm Sam Mendelson. I am a senior at Design Tech High School. Uh, it's a unique high school south of San Francisco. Uh, I'll put my contact information at the end. Uh, you may have heard of my high school, Design Tech High School, as the Oracle High School. Uh, here's a little picture. Cool. So the first question you might have is, uh, doesn't X software already calculate grades? Absolutely. Uh, but my school, remember I said unique, has their own grading system this year. So uh, I'm going to try to explain it a little bit succinctly. Uh, but basically, their goal is to focus on the student's knowledge instead of having someone take a test and then forget everything they just learned. Uh, they name the system competency-based learning, or CBL, to show that it's really focused on competency instead of just memorizing. Uh, so they removed almost all letter grades, uh, no letter grades on assignments, no percentages, but they still included a method uh, to give you a final grade at the end of a semester so that colleges are able to understand it and uh, hopefully get in. 
And so uh, this conversion method to letter grades is uh, almost an algorithm. And uh, I built a calculator to solve this problem. So let me explain why it's a problem. So um, if you get confused on this section, don't worry. I was incredibly confused for months along with the rest of the student body. But basically, um, each assignment, we have a math quiz here, uh, has a number of outcomes aligned to it uh, from a one to a four, where uh, with a one, you're just getting started. With a four, you're uh, pretty much an expert on that subject. Um, so traditionally, you would say a student got an 11 out of 12 on this assignment. But um, with this grading system, the 11 out of 12 doesn't matter. Only the three scores do. So an outcome, um, this one we'll call it simplifying algebraic equations. Um, there are three different assignments that um, the student was graded on this skill from. Um, and then so we drop the lowest score and average out the rest to get a mean average. So this student's final score on this is 3.5. And then so finally, there we go. Uh, next, there we go. So finally, um, a course has multiple of these outcomes, and then there's a final score. But um, what's their grade? And so um, the school gave students this ridiculous formula. Um, so first, they told you to calculate all of your averages. So um, I have done that over here. Then they're like, Okay, so now you need to figure out 75% of the count of outcomes and then round it down. So here that's two. Then you need to see if that outcome, see if that number is uh, the most, maps to the most above value. So here we have um, 3.25 is our lowest of the top two. And so that matches to 2.6. And then uh, none of our scores are below, uh, in this case, 2.2. So we have a B plus in this class. And so that's ridiculous. And so every student was saying, this is way too hard to do. Um, but really, the issue was that they didn't understand what was going on and how they got a grade. And so uh, this gave me a great idea. I'm like, hey, I can build a calculator to do this. So um, I the summer before, I discovered a security vulnerability, which led to an internship at GoGuardian um, the previous summer. I am well versed in React, Redux, and Go. And more importantly, I realized like I can solve a huge problem for the student body. And so um, I named it Canvas CBL. So our basic flow here is we're going to take information from Canvas, which is where all of the learning information is stored. Uh, we're going to calculate it, and then we're going to show it to students via some type of UI. I built a little web app. And so uh, let's write a calculator. So I built the front end in React and Redux. But uh, I'm going to focus more on the Go API because you know we're Go for fun. So I had three design constraints um, that I wanted to make my app do. So I had speed. So I want students to be able to see their grades quickly. I wanted an API so that other student projects could consume grades. Uh, another student project actually did, which is really exciting. That was our course scheduler, and I wanted grades to always be up to date. So uh, I chose this tech stack right here. Um, We've got React and Redux uh, for maintainability. And also just because you know I, the school was changing the grading system a lot, and I really wanted to be able to uh, change with them. Uh, and I chose Ant D, which is a visual library somewhat similar to Bootstrap. And um, for on the back end, obviously, I chose Go. I chose Go. Uh, Julian Schmidt's HTTP router, which I really liked because it was super low level, super fast. Uh, and all I really needed to do was add path parts. Uh, and then I chose Postgres. Um, it's easy. It's maintainable. Uh, and so how do you get grades from Canvas? Um, there's this ridiculous flowchart, which um, don't worry about understanding it. But the wonderful part about Go is that is Go's massive concurrency. And so um, I had about 110 concurrent students loading this app. And so with Go, I was able to handle it on a free Heroku Dino with no slowdowns, which was just absolutely incredible. And so you can see we have to fan out into Go routines three specific times during the grade calculation. So we'll get information about their courses and their kids if they're a parent. Then we will go back to the learning management system, talk uh, and ask it for all of the grade information. And then finally, uh, we can calculate grades. Now, you might be wondering why are you calculating grades with Go routines? Because um, there are so many for loops and so much sorting in this absurd calculation. Uh, and then we can finally encode them. Oh, one minute. OK. Um, and so here's what the final result looked like. 
Uh, we have names, we have course names and grades. Finally, uh, so let's build some UI. So I've got my little dashboard here. So here is uh, all of the classes, grades, and a previous grade feature I eventually built. Very happy about that one. Then we have a uh, grade breakdown. So students can see a lot more information about where their grade came from. And then we have a mobile view because everyone loves mobile. Uh, and it's just nice to like get an email, hey, something was graded, boom, you can see your grade. So that's about it. Here are a couple fun facts. I think I have enough time, 25 seconds. Okay, I uh, wrote the first version in three weeks, shut down due to unspecified legal reasons, but it became my college admissions essay. So it really turned out to be a uh, happy thing. Uh, we had about 15,000 lines of Golang, about 7,000 lines of JavaScript in the front end. 55% uh, of all students used it at 110 at once. Okay, thank you very much. Perfect on time. Feel free to reach out to me. I am looking for summer. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that was great. Um, it's a shame he got pulled out of the stream. Um, but that was, uh, I truly really enjoyed that presentation. That was wonderful. Uh, what a weird, weird grading system. Um, but kudos, uh, Sam for, for tackling that and take that on. It looks like a pretty cool project. And it's a real shame that the school shut it down on you. Uh, the good news is you're going to do pretty well trying to look for a job next year. I think Sam was saying he was looking for a summer internship next year. So uh, try to follow up with Sam if you're interested. Uh, so with that said, I think we have time for uh, probably just one more talk, um, but uh, we'll see how we go here. So let's bring up our next speaker, whose name is actually Go. Hi, hello. Hey, Go, how you doing? Yeah, pretty good. Yes. Fantastic. Where are you calling us from today? Uh, I'm from Japan, Tokyo. Japan, Tokyo. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, welcome. Uh, it's very exciting to have this here. And you're going to talk about uh, finding errors related to GORM. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Fantastic. Well, take it away. I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Okay, I changed title, but let me start. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Go Sagawa. Uh, I'm very lucky. To, my name is Go. I'm a back-end engineer of Unfactory. It is a Japanese company doing IoT and smartphone app business. Think, uh, then I make the back-end system. Now I'm working for one smartphone app's back-end system. It, it is using GORM. GORM is an ORM library. Recently, the version two was released, but unfortunately today I am talking about version one. This is a simple function using GORM, update bar of table full. It looks like no problem, but it has problem. What I want to update one record, what I want to, what I want is update one record, but if who is nil, this function update all records of the full table. It is really, really dangerous. There are some solutions to avoid this problem. First, it is sad to say, but stop using GORM. Instead, you can use GORP, SKLX, SKLBoiler, et cetera. I also think today's session of Postgres, it was full of knowledge. Second, if you're using MySQL, you can set option SQL safe updates. It stops all data update on the data layer. Third, GORM also have that option. Block global updates, you can also prevent using this. Fourth, writing the, the test. That it is baiting, but sometimes sometimes it is hard. Is it all? No. Fifth option, using static analysis. Why I took this solution? Because I want to prevent not only check all data updates, but also check other errors by mistake. I created a tool named Chrome Checker. GORM checker's detail is locked up. First of all, it, it wrote very roughly and please use it as sample. This tool checks three things. First, it checks using a private function like db.where.where, something like that. Why I need it, I'll explain later. Second, at least where function exists. Third, check only one time exists of these five functions. How I did make made GORM checker? First, I used the library Go Static Analysis Skeleton. It is very helpful to make a skeleton code of static analysis. After that, pick up nodes for analysis in GORM checker using those two type of nodes, stfunkdecl and 
is the code explanation. If you want to know, please check the code. Then when you, when I faced some problems, link the document and debug by ASD print is very helpful. This tool works like that. Just set a directory path. I use this for my application and it got a lot of errors. Then check how it works with codes. The code is first I showed. It's allotted because it doesn't have a, the real function. Add it and it looks like OK. Then second, find function not exist. This, this function always written near table. Then add it. OK. Then third one is it looks like not have the find function, but it lit, uh, it writes after real function. It is just a rule, but I want to write same things same way in team, so I did. Then move it. I also find some unexpected problems. In this case, pick uh, this code using a plug. This added because it contains the find. Compared to find, plug is different work. Uh, it works differently on the point of logical deletion. I find a bug. And it is also another case of finding unexpected function load. It is allotted by two more updates. I also I asked the team members to don't write like this because it is business logic and it is not, it shouldn't write here. Then conclusion. Be careful about unexpected all date updates when you're using GOM or other library. It's very dangerous. Second, you can create a static analysis tool easily. Go is well supported too in doing this. Third, static analysis possibly find unexpected code. It is very powerful and it was very fun. Okay, that that's three things that is uh, uh, I wanted to say today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, that's all. Why, well, thanks, Go. I appreciate that. That was. Uh, is there a URL, a GitHub for that? Sorry. Uh, or was was is there a GitHub URL, a repo that uh, people yeah. can go to? Yeah. What is it? Oh, so yeah, I can understand. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, uh, yeah. put it online. Thank you so much. We appreciate yeah, thank it, you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, we have time for one more speaker, and I'm really excited uh, to bring up our next speaker, particularly because of uh, the title of his talk. So, Ryan, are you there? Hey, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear, and I can see you. How are you oh, doing? I'm doing great. Great. And where are you coming from today? I'm coming from uh, the Seattle area where I've seen hail, rain, snow in the mountains, and sunshine all today. That seems about right for Seattle. Yep. You're actually our second Seattle speaker today. Uh, cool, somebody cool. else uh, also called in a bit earlier. So I I'm very glad we could have you on. We had enough time to get you on because you're going to be talking about overcoming imposter syndrome, right? <laughs> Or something like that, yeah. Fantastic. I was really worried you were going to get, uh, you weren't going to make it, and then I was going to be like, oh, the irony of this talk. Uh, oh, yeah. But let's, uh, let's hear from Ryan. All right. Well, hi there, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Brewer, as Mark said. This is my first talk in front of a bunch of strangers, so uh, please give me as much grace as you can. I'm trying to do the same for myself. Uh, also, this is a topic I'm probably not really qualified to talk about, imposter syndrome, right? So let's get started. So what is this all about? Who am I? Why this talk? So I work on the compute platform team at Nordstrom, where our mission is to provide a platform that reduces the operational burden of our development teams. Um, I love Go. I've been a gopher since about 2014, and this is my fourth straight GopherCon. Um, it's just been awesome. Uh, I've got two kiddos who are growing up way too fast, but I love watching them grow. So it's little this, little that. Um, and then I also, I love to play in the mountains, hiking, snowboarding, some climbing. Um, I'm excited about that snow we're getting right now. Um, why this talk? Well, if, you, if you've been watching any of the presentations at GopherCon or listening to MCs or looking at Discord, looking at Slack, all that, 
it, it's real. It's a real thing. It's something that people deal with a lot. Eric mentioned it right before these lightning talks as well. Uh, if you caught that, um, and I'm just I'm really inspired by the Go community and wanted to give back and try and overcome something for myself just to demonstrate and model for other people again, including my kids. So um, I mentioned my kids a couple times. A little parenting story for you. So a few years ago, um, when my kids were were learning to ride bikes, despite being younger, my daughter managed to to figure it out first. Uh, two weekends later, her brother followed. It was it, he just needed to see her do it. But why did it take so long? And then why was he able to find success finally? Um, so part of it was, I think, a, a bias toward inaction on his part. And I say that because I've experienced a lot of the same things, and I imagine a lot of y'all have as well, where acting means you're going to be seen. Being seen means you might be judged. And if you're judged, that means you're putting yourself in a position where you could be vulnerable. And vulnerability can suck, especially when you expect negative judgment. So how did he get by it? Well, he saw someone else do it. And importantly, someone that he felt sort of matched him. He, like the fact that his sister could do it, great. Oh, if she can do it, I can. And he was able to, to make it happen and ride his bike. So um, kind of a similar journey that I've been on with GopherCon. Um, 2017 was my first my first GopherCon. I attended with uh, with one coworker had a chance to dip my feet in a little bit and feel what it was like to go to a conference, any conference. And I was really, the community and diversity oriented talks were actually my favorite. I love the technical stuff, but those were just, just blew me away by the way the community supports, supports each other and, and is able to put on such a, a cool conference like this where everybody's approachable and awesome. Um, so at the end of that, that go for con, you know, we have the raffle every year. I won the golden ticket and I got to come back and do 2018 go for con all thanks to go for con. And it was just, it was a, it was awesome. I was really, I was just feeling a lot of gratitude the whole time. Um, the go for swarms were amazing. At one point we had, I think we were trying to put a dinner together when we had like, like 10 or 15 people. And then by the time we called the restaurant, we had 30. By the time we arrived, we had 50 and the restaurant still made it happen. And it's because we're not going to turn anybody away. It's like, oh, you're going to dinner. Okay, come on. Come on and join us. Um, last year, there was a little bit of talk in um, in the GopherCon Slack about going to a baseball game. And so I reached out to, to folks and said, hey, let's make this happen. And we ended up, three of us ended up going to a game last year. Um, and the other two people that I went with, uh, Jonathan Bodner had a great talk this morning. Um, and then uh, the other day, Dylan Bork had a, had a talk on uh, at GopherCon on um, uh, monorepo and, and dealing with that. And it was just, that was his first first talk. And I was like, okay, well, this is awesome. People can do this. So I, at, at that baseball game, I, I kind of started thinking about how I can give back. So I started asking around a little bit, talked to some of the conference organizers and such. And was I was uh, given a chance to participate in the call for proposals process for GopherCon 2020 and talk about imposter syndrome, trying to read all these proposals about all these awesome things people are doing. And like, I'm not qualified to judge this, not in the least. Um, but I got through it. I participated in it. And I'm, again, grateful to GopherCon for, for letting me help out and, and be a part of it. Um, so that's kind of my GopherCon story. Um, I, so the only thing that I want to kind of conclude with, and I guess I'm going fast, so ahead of time. Um, but first of all, you can do it. I mean, I'm, I'm 43 and have never talked to this many people at once in my life. And it's been really kind of nerve wracking. Um, but if I can, you can. And if, Another thing is a bias toward action. Um, with a story with my son and with a bunch of my own stories that I didn't really have time to tell because they wouldn't fit, um, I've had a lot of experiences where I've had a bias toward inaction. And what I found is when I have a bias toward action, I'm generally happier and more effective in the things I do in life. Third thing is we're all human, even Brian. Um, 
It was just, it was like every, every presenter that I've talked to at GopherCon um, has been just really like welcoming and willing to chat and have conversations. And I just, I had that experience with Brian. I didn't even know John had presented something at a previous GopherCon before I talked to him at the baseball game. Um, it, just, it was like, oh, everyone's human. Um, another the last thing is to just kind of start small, introduce yourself to people, offer to help, create community. If you're not a baseball fan, find something that interests you. I mean, with a, a community of 2,000 gophers at, at the next gopher con, you're probably going to find other people who want to do it. Finally, a little bit of suggested reading. Um, the Four Agreements was a great book that really helped me kind of with perspective on keeping my own, my, myself to myself. And then I'm a huge fan of Brene Brown. Um, a lot of her work has really helped me in terms of how I think about and deal with vulnerability and shame and that kind of stuff. So anyway, that's all I've got. I guess I'm not. Oh, oh okay. I guess uh, poor Ryan got pulled. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, that talk was uh, excellent. And I'm really glad um, that that's going to be our, our closing talk of this year's lightning talks. Uh, and again, I, I, you know, I said at the very beginning today, and I said it on Wednesday too, one of the great things about that I love about the lightning talks uh, is the fact that uh, a lot of people can get their foot in the door uh, from a community perspective um, and, and, and work their way in. It's a great place uh, to welcome new members of the community. Uh, and, and Ryan, that was like said, that was a great story. And, you know, and I'll share, uh, you know, my own experiences. Imposter syndrome is absolutely real. Uh, <laughs> I, I have never actually been selected to speak <laughs> at GopherCon um, on the, on the main stage. So, you know, I, I I'm right there with you. Uh, and even this morning, uh, we did a go time game show. Um, it was myself, Matt Ryer, Kat Zian, and, um, and Alan Corbis. And, you know, before we went on the air, we were all joking about how poor we were going to do on this Go Knowledge um, game show that was obviously just for fun and ended up being a great time. But, you know, there's four people who, um, you know, who the community knows and, and who presented at conferences like GopherCon all sitting there uh, expressing their own imposter syndromes about how they don't think they're going to do particularly well, right? So we all have imposter syndromes in us. Um, we all feel that uh, deep inside, that that scariness. Um, but I encourage you all to, to take part uh, and, and, and take that step. Start with your local meetups. Start with lightning talks at conferences. Um, start by just maybe even pre-recording yourself and just putting it online. Um, so, you know, really try to get out there and be a part of it. And we want to hear from you uh, next year at GopherCon and at all of the other great Go conferences. Um, and before I sign off here, I just want to say thank you, uh, as always, to everybody who's involved in GopherCon, um, from, you know, uh, Brian and Eric, to, you know, and Heather and Julie and Jose um, and everybody on the CFP committee um, and everybody else who's working behind the scenes. Um, to make all of this happen for you. Uh, and of course, the speakers and uh, all of you as well, the Go community. So I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing you all in 2021 uh, in person, fingers crossed. Um, but if not, stay safe out there. Please be careful, wear a mask uh, and uh, have a happy new year. See you in 2021.